Cool. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for coming to my talk. Like, it means a lot to me. Uh, I hope you're going to come out, you know, pumped, full of energy, and just, I don't know, just like get out there and do some marketing, you know? <laughs> Uh, so yes, my name is Michal, and to be honest with you, it's actually hasn't been nine years in marketing. Um, it's actually been ten years as of a couple of weeks ago. Now the reason uh, that I stated uh, nine in the beginning and not ten is when I spoke to Caitlin, it was nine years. I didn't want to put down ten years uh, on the application because who knows? Maybe she would have checked out my LinkedIn profile. Go, he said 10 years. It's, it's nine years, you know. Who is this lying person, you know? Who is this charlatan? Um, so, and that is, I guess, my first lesson. Uh, lesson point zero, zero point five. Uh, only state what's true and confirm at the time of you making those words. There's nothing worse than having to backpedal on whatever you said earlier. Um, so, if you're making a game and you know you're going to be coming out on Steam 100%, but you're thinking, yeah, we could probably come out on the Switch too. Don't confirm the Switch if you're not sure. Um, you can always confirm the Switch later on. It's a nice little beat that you can do. But if you do end up confirming it, and then all of a sudden you realize, well, thanks to Unity, now I'm going to have to maybe think about <laughs> not doing this anymore. <laughs> uh, then you have to you know, tell people, oh, well, we're sorry, we can't come out on the Switch. And then all the players will be like, well, why not? You know, and then you have to come up with an excuse, and it's, you know, gonna have to one of those tweets with like that image where you explain, dear players, you know, this is what happened, uh, and it's just a headache. And you know how players are—they're very emotional. So, <laughs> don't do this to yourself. Uh, just confirm everything that's true at the time of you saying those words. Uh, cool. So, very quickly, who am I? Uh, my name is Mihal, and I'm the owner of a video games marketing agency called Thirty Two Thirty Three. I've been working in games for 10 years, um, and yeah, I worked on some pretty cool games. Uh, I specialize in PC and console games, uh, and I worked from big AAA titles all the way to premium indies. Now, I'm a Perth boy, I'm a Perth local boy, uh, and I started my career in 2013 for this studio called Techland, which was in Poland, um, and I worked on this game called Dying Light. And I guess I'm just trying to say it's really, really cool to be back home and actually seeing, wow, there's all these cool things happening here, you know, like cool games, cool crowds, cool events. Like, I'm so happy that that's actually happening, you know, like we can do so much more than just, you know, dick holes in the ground. So that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes. So, oh, yeah, 10 years in the gaming industry. Um, so yeah, after two years working in the, on Dying Light and Dying Light the following uh, and Torment Tides of Numenera, I was like, look, I want to try something of my own. And that's how my little marketing agency came to be. And in the last seven and a bit years, I had a chance to work on titles like The Medium, The Sinking City, Sherlock Holmes franchises, uh, Bramble, and my first Aussie game, Dinkum, which is probably like the most Aussiest game you can <laughs> get. Uh, so that was a wicked. Uh, but before I go any further, just a little disclaimer. Look, uh, all of those things that I'm going to be saying to you, these are just my opinions. Like, I could be right, I could be wrong. Um, please use that inner radar of yours. And, you know, if you're listening to me and you're thinking, yeah, I don't know about this guy, go with your gut. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but if there is something in there that you think, oh, yeah, that's actually pretty cool, uh, well, that's awesome. I'm glad. Uh, I just hope that by the end of this presentation, there's going to be a lot more green flags than red flags. Um, that's the ratio that I'm going for. Let me know how we go. Uh, but yes, uh, that's enough from me. Let's get into it. I'll just have a quick little sip of water as well. This is intense. There we go. Um, so, lesson number one. It's all about the hook. Now, I don't really have a definition of what a hook is. Like to me, a hook is pretty much that thing when you look at it and you see it and you just go, damn, like that's wicked, you know, that grabs you, it's like this X factor, like sometimes you just can't put your finger on it, you know? And and I know what you're saying, you know, Michal, yeah, cool, you know, come up with a hook, you know, that's easy said than done. I know, I know. But I'll tell you this, it's a lot easier to reel people in with a hook than with that one. Um, so if you can, um, see if you can kind of incorporate a hook into your game. Now, for me, um, I feel there's like these different types of hooks that you have. And the first hook that you can, that I feel is out there is a visual hook. 
Now, when I'm thinking of visual hooks, there's two games that come to my mind. First one is Cuphead. Now, <laughs> if you've seen that game, straight away you go, awesome 1920s cartoon aesthetic. I've never seen anything like this before. This is fantastic. Like, you might not even know the name of the game, but as soon as you type in 1920s like cartoon game slash platformer, Cuphead will come, uh, come out. Uh, another game that also came to my mind is this game called Unrecord. Now, I actually didn't know the name of this game, uh, but I don't know if you've seen this game that made Splash Online, which looks hyper-realistic, first-person shooter that looks like it's being shot from a body cam footage. That's Unrecord. Um, now, I didn't know the name of the game, but all I had to do was type in Google, uh, first-person shooter that looks like body cam footage, boom, Unrecord is there. Now, when this game came out, or the trailer came out, People went nuts, they're like, oh my god, like, is this real? And like, the dev had to make a video showing how it all looks like inside the engine, going, yes, this is real. And everyone was like, oh my god, I can't believe it's so real and it's real. Uh, it really helps you out, get the audience in and get them to kind of pay attention to, what, uh, to your game. So if you can, uh, I'm not saying go for hyper-realistic graphics, but you know, maybe having something, a bit of a visual cue or something that sticks out from the rest of the games out there, could help you out. Another hooks that I feel that are out there, I guess, and this is like a probably worst kind of phrasing I could have used. Um, so like story-based hooks, but I also mean like narrative-driven hooks, character hooks, setting hooks. And the first game that comes to my mind with a good story slash character hook is Untitled Goose Game. Uh, <laughs> it's the it's a, f it's a game in which you play as a goose, and like I never knew until I saw that game that I actually wanted to play as a goose, you know? <laughs> like, it's wicked. Uh, and then the goose actually steals stuff, so, you know, you're playing as a, as a um, I'm not gonna use the words, but annoying goose. <laughs> um, and that is a fantastic hook, you know? Straight away, people just go, oh yeah, it's the goose game, you know? And I wouldn't be surprised if the people uh, that make Untitled Goose Game, maybe even kind of, use the title as a bit of an SEO play, you know, just in case someone says, typed in Goose Game into, um, into Google. I don't know, I'm, I didn't work with them. Uh, so yeah, story-based hooks definitely help out. Uh, I also worked on this game, Thinkum, which is kind of like an Animal Crossing Stardew Valley that's set in the Australian outback. The fact that we're set in an Australian inspired um, scenery, that was a huge hook for us. Uh, like when I lived in Poland, if I told someone that I'm from Australia, everyone would be like, oh my God, you know, it's like, you're from Australia, I always wanted to see that place, you know, I kind of felt like I was a Jamaican or something. <laughs> um, and we kind of started hearing that on Steam forums too, like a lot of people uh, bought Thinkin because they kind of want to experience Australia, like maybe they can't afford to come over here, maybe, you know, the trip is a long trip, you can't get that holiday. Um, so they kind of use Dinkum as a bit of a, what we like to call it, digital tourism. Um, so, yeah, uh, just something that, I don't know, maybe will help out. Uh, third types of hooks, uh, gameplay hooks. And a game that comes to my mind when it comes to gameplay hooks is this game called Metal Hellsinger. This is a first person heavy metal rhythm shooter. Uh, so it pretty much combined two really different genres, rhythm game and a shooter, pop them into one, and all of a sudden when you see those clips and when you hear the description, you kind of go, oh wow, this is different, this is something else, um, and it kind of grabs you in and you go, all right, I'm gonna keep, a, keep an eye on this one. And it kind of goes into the last point, um, combining two opposites to make something new. Um, some of the devs that I work with, when they're sort of thinking about hooks, that's like an exercise that they do. And to give you an example, maybe for a setting, imagine the 1920s. Um, you know, like those long coats, people smoking cigarettes, uh, art deco houses, those old cars. But it's set in the future, in cyberpunk world. So you've got a 1920s futuristic look, you know, two different opposites. Um, or maybe you're making a game that is all about, you know, I don't know, maybe a um, game that's set in uh, nightclubs or at rave parties, but instead of electronic music, they're just playing classical music. Uh, so having these different opposites could maybe mash up and come up with something cool, new, and unique. Lesson number two, 
Make a game people want to play, fill in a need, fill in a gap. Pretty much what Michael was saying. Um, so yeah. Um, Look, if you're making games not to make a profit, but to, I don't know, get things out of your head and treating gaming as a medium to express those emotions that you have and you want to get some stuff out of yourself, this slide doesn't apply to you. Just keep doing what you're doing because cool things happen out of those projects. But if you are making games so you can make some money and maybe afford food and you know a house, <laughs> you know, those are pretty cool things, um, well, make games that people would want to buy. Um, once again, you know, fantastic advice, me help. Well, what I would do is, there's a lot of cool information out there about, like, first of all, what sort of games sell well, or which type of genres sell well on these platforms. So, this is not going to be that surprising, but one of the top selling genres on Steam, on PC-based players, are, for example, strategies and simulation games. So, if you are, think you're making a strategy game, well, PC is probably going to be the place for you. When it comes to puzzle games, unfortunately, Steam is not the place to go. Uh, I'm not saying people don't buy puzzle games on Steam. It's just that the market demand for you know strategies like this for puzzle games is a little bit that. But that little part, still a lot of people. However, saying all of that, a good place to go with your puzzle game is, for example, Nintendo Switch. So if you're thinking, all right, let's make a puzzle game, um, I should think about getting into Nintendo Switch in that case. And you can also go deeper with it. Uh, say if you're making a survival horror game, right? And you want to find out what it is that people want. Uh, what you can do is go on Steam, look on the survival horror genre tag, bring up the top 100 selling games, and just see what other tags on Steam these games have. Uh, after analyzing it a little bit more, you might realize that, you know, people who like survival horror games don't really care about open worlds, you know? It doesn't matter if it's an open world game or a level-based game. What they actually care about is experiencing like really weird, like mentally ill monsters, you know? That's what they want. Um, so straight away, going in deep, having a bit of a read through what sells, what not, um, having a read through people's comments, it's going to give you better of an idea of what it is that you should do or implement in your game to make it more appealing for people to buy it. Um, and filling in a need and filling in a gap is a fantastic thing too. I worked on this game called Aragami, which was pretty much a indie version of Tenchu. And the people that worked on that game, they were like, look, there's heaps of Tenchu fans out there. We just want to make a game that kind of fills that need. The worst thing that could happen is if they announced a new Tenchu, thank God they didn't. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, it, it, it's a fantastic thing to do. Uh, so yeah, so that was lesson number two. Lesson number three, don't chase trends. Now, in the 10 years that I've been doing this, I've realized that there's all these different trends. There'll be moments where certain genres are hot and everyone's making them, and then all of a sudden, a new thing comes along, and it's, it's a cyclical thing that goes up and down, up and down. I felt like for about, well, I think it's kind of dying now, but there was this peak, or maybe half, six months ago, a year ago, where there was so many light, uh, sims coming out like similar to Stardew Valley. You know those games where you know you're working in the city and it sucks and then your grandfather dies and he leaves you a <laughs> crappy farm that's like just about to fall apart? Um, those games. Um, I love those games by the way, but there were so many of them being made uh, and they were just coming out with different twangs to it. The market started becoming oversaturated and people just started going, all right, not an out of uh, life farming game. Maybe we can try to find something new. Before that, I remember there was a phase where there were so many simulator games coming out. You know, gas station simulator. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, like um, farming simulator, but that's still going strong. Um, yeah, there was like, you know, World War II tank simulator, simulator simulator. It was insane. And once again, everyone was kind of hyped, everyone was playing that, and then eventually it kind of died off and they moved on to the next thing. And just very lastly, before that, I remember the walking simulator stage where there were so many walking sims being made. It got to the point where people were like, no, we can't take this anymore. You know, we need a different genre. So, uh, now I don't make games, but my friends and my clients, they make games. And I know that making a game takes longer than six months to do. Uh, it probably takes about, you know, I don't know, a year, year and a half, two years, three years, five years, seven years, even more. 
So if you're making something today to fit a trend that's happening right now, by the time you come out, that trend or that genre might no longer be the hot thing that's popular. Um, so instead of chasing a trend, chase this. Chase the people, make the game people want to play. Fill a need, fill a gap. Uh, lesson number four. Uh, marketing is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so when I do marketing campaigns, I like to do like absolute minimum six months. Like anything less than that, don't do it. Like buy yourself time. Uh, so six months is the minimum, and I worked on campaigns that lasted a year, year and a half, two and a half years. Uh, the most I think I worked on a campaign was four years, and that was getting a little bit too much. But pretty much what I'm trying to say is that it's a marathon, not a sprint, meaning don't say everything all at once when you, for example, announce a game. Because uh, if you say everything straight away, you're going to run out of things to say. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to create a campaign that actually tells the story in itself. Now, just to give you an example, um, let's say Cyberpunk. Uh, not the teaser trailer, but the first proper trailer with the, the release at E3 ages ago. What they showed first, it was the world. You know, you would have the character that was sitting on the metro. You were just talking about stuff like, oh, you know, the world is crap and everything. But, you know, everyone's poor, but we all love bam, 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 bam. Night City, you know? Uh, and then you would have this trailer that's showing all these crazy things that are happening there. You know, people coming in, knocking off doors, guns blazing, chases, you know, kids in VR, uh, in rooms doing crazy stuff. That trailer there, that was just there to sell you the world. That was the first thing. You know, here's the world that you're going to be in. Look at all these crazy things happening there. Nothing about the story, nothing about the characters. Later on, a few months later, that's when they would introduce the character called V. So you kind of put a little step uh, to the story of what the campaign is about. So this is gradually hyping people up. So if you can, divide your campaign into marketing beats. Kind of think about what you want to say at which point. And yeah, you're not going to run out of things to say that, uh, that quickly. And that's a nice thing, because there's nothing worse than going, I got nothing to say, and I got three months before my game comes out. Now, lesson number five. <laughs> not everyone heard about your game. Or saw your gift from two months ago. Um, believe it or not, I actually learned this lesson like six months ago. On <laughs> <laughs> so it took me nine years to realize this. Um, but it was for this game called Bramble the Mountain King. Um, I worked on that game for like two and a half years. And every day I would wake up, I would just have Bramble in front of me. Uh, and I guess that's why I'm biased. Because I'm thinking, well, you know, I keep seeing this stuff. Probably everybody else has too. And I thought we did like a pretty good campaign where we appeared in a lot of places and you know, we got some nice wish lists and everything. So I was like, surely, like we've covered everyone, you know? And then two weeks before the game would come out, I would still post videos or tweets or we'll release trailers and there'll be comments like uh, saying, oh wow, what is this game? I've never seen it before, you know? And I was like, wow, there's actually a lot of people on this planet, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, so. That was just because you sitting and looking at this game over and over and over, it doesn't mean that everyone else has to. So it's okay um, to go with that assumption that not everyone has heard about my game. And not everyone has seen that gift that you posted a couple of months ago too. Uh, once again, with Bramble, uh, there was this one clip that we did uh, that we posted on Twitter and on TikTok that went viral. And it was this clip of Ola, the main uh, character, just running away from this monster. Uh, this monster is chasing him through this mud. It was a very intense scene. That clip got like half a million views on Twitter and a few million views on TikTok. We were like, wicked. The thing is, that wasn't the first time we actually played that video. Uh, it was the third time we showed this video. Um, the, third time we, the first time we showed this video, it was part of a bigger 15-minute IGN gameplay reveal that we showed. And no one really commented about that. No one chopped that up and said, wow, check out this scene. It's fantastic. Um, the second time we posted this video was, it was part of a, like a little mini trailer on socials that we would make, like a couple of scenes here and there, uh, just to set the mood for if someone comes across the game. And a little snippet of that scene was in it, and no one really reacted. Sure, we got a couple of likes and retweets, but no one went nuts. Uh, so then the third time, I was like, eh, let's just put the whole scene, you know, see what happens. Um, and it blew up, and it was really, really nice, and, and it felt cool. And 
You know, the dev would come out and say, oh, did you mean that? I'm like, yeah, of course, yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, look, don't worry about, you know, thinking, oh, I've shown this before, I can't show it again. It's okay. It's okay to recycle content. Like, obviously, don't go crazy and show the same stuff every two days. Um, but if that video that you showed a couple of months ago still is reflective of the project that you're working on now and it still, you know, tells the truth, um, Share it again. Um, some new people will come across it. You might never know who's going to see it and who's going to retweet it or share it around. Uh, it's okay to recycle. It's fine. Uh, lesson number six, establishing your key pillars uh, or establish your key pillars and then repeat, 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 repeat. Um, this is a lesson that my boss at Teclan passed on to me. Uh, pretty much he told us this. So first what you do is when you have a game, you establish your key pillars, uh, which is a fancy way of saying USPs, uh, or a fancy way of saying the things that make my game special. Now, there's a really cool exercise I can do to kind of help you out with that. I can show you later. Uh, but once you have this established, like seriously, like your life's gonna be so much easier because you will know what it is that I wanna be talking about. And then, once you figure out those things that you want to talk about, you got to make sure that every asset or piece of communication that you do that comes out from your mouth at least shows one of those key pillars. Um, so any screenshot that you have, especially on Steam, make sure that it shows at least one key pillar. Any interview questions that you do, try to slide in a key pillar. Gameplay, demo, uh, trailers, very important. Show at least one key pillar in your communication. Because if you don't, how are people supposed to figure out what makes this game special? Just tell them what it is. Uh, and if you, it, otherwise, you know, it's a missed opportunity for, I don't know, tooting your own horn. Um, so do it. Uh, ingrain that into your, into, my, into your mind. I had this too, like if I wouldn't have done it, you know, my boss said I'm gonna whoop your butts if you don't do this. Um, so yes, it definitely helps out heaps uh, when I do my own promotions. And lesson number seven. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, I had this chat with, with a dev once where when, I, when we had a chat, and I was like, all right, so what do you plan on doing in terms of promotion? And their answer was, answer was well, we're going to concentrate just on TikTok. And I was like, that's cool and everything, but like, not everyone is on TikTok. Um, like, I like TikTok. I, I think it's a fantastic place to waste time. Um, and I love it, but... You know, there's heaps of people that could potentially be your audience uh, that don't use TikTok. Or if they use TikTok, they want to come across your, uh, your video. So what you want to do is you want to cast, like Michael said, the biggest net you can possibly can, and you can use all of those great marketing uh, avenues and channels to you. So social media, fantastic. Like, I love it. I, I like TikTok. I like Reddit. I use a little bit of Twitter. Um, but, you know, some people might like Instagram, etc. So figure out what it is that you, uh, that you like and kind of resonates with, with, your, with yourself. Um, but you also got avenues such as public relations. So the press, um, influencers. I mean, a lot of people get their information from influencers. I love Game Ranks, this YouTube channel. I always listen to them. I, you know, they tell me, all right, these games are good to play. These games are worth checking out. Don't bother with that one. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, that saved my time. Um, there's digital events now, which are huge. So many people discover games just via Steam itself. Like you'll log on Steam, you go on your front page, all of a sudden you might see this banner saying games from Future Game Show. And then people will click on it. They might notice a key art, key art, very important. And they'll click on it and go, all right, this game is cool. Bang, I'll just add it to my wish list. Uh, there's physical events too uh, that you can interact with players. And hopefully if there's any press, you invite the press over to come to your physical event presence so they play your game and write about it on their sites. Uh, first and third parties, just a very fancy way of saying Nintendo, PlayStation, Alienware, Steel Series, etc. So many people are um, subscribing to Nintendo YouTube channel. And if you put your trailer on there, I mean, you're gonna get tens of thousands of views. Um, so also other games, that's something that I kind of discovered recently. Uh, so there's all these fantastic avenues that you can grab people with and if you play your cards right, you can actually get all of those for free too. Um, so definitely, definitely try to check them out and get that wide, uh, net as wide as you can. 
Lesson number eight, turn threats into opportunities. Doesn't always happen, it's a hard one, uh, but sometimes it can work out. Um, now threats are things that you don't really have much influence over. Uh, so you might be, I don't know, working on your game for five years and you're going, all right, we're coming out, and you just made an announcement saying, my game's coming out on July 28th, and all of a sudden the next day, CD Projekt Red goes, we are making uh, Witcher 4 and it's coming out on July 28th. All of a sudden you're going, I'm screwed, you know? And that happens, uh, it's all part of life. Um, but there are also times when these threads come about and you can actually get something out of them. And this one example that I have was for a game that I worked on called Inquinati, which was a turn-based strategy that's set on pages of medieval books in which a rabbit's bum can be deadlier than a dog's sword. Um, two months to come up with that one-liner. Um, and this is kind of how it looks. Now, we we're, were working on this game for like five years, and five months before release, we were like, yep, sweet, we've got it, we've got a nice visual hook, we've got some wish lists, we just signed a deal with Game Pass. This is awesome, like, let's ride the wave of you know, of awesomeness. Then all of a sudden we're sitting at home, we're watching E3 last year, E3, the Bethesda Xbox Showcase, and then what do we see? Out of nowhere, boom, Pentiment gets announced. And we were like, like, here's a game that's got pretty much very similar visual hook. It's a different genre, fine, we're a turn-based strategy, there's an anthro-driven game, but this is made by Obsidian. And we're like, oh, how are we going to compete with this, you know? And we're like, oh my god, this is screwed, we're all screwed, everything is screwed. Like, <laughs> two days of just going, this is all screwed, you know? Uh, but after we kind of settled down a little bit, we realized, okay, well, this game is coming out to Game Pass, and, you know, we're coming out to Game Pass. We had a look at our Twitter account, and Josh Sawyer, who was the main lead on this game, he was following us on Twitter. So we kind of wrote him an email, uh, a little message saying, hey Josh, how are you? Like, congrats on announcing Pentiment, it looks great. <laughs> um, uh, by the way, since our games are kind of similar, we both love medieval manuscripts, how do you feel about doing a little me uh, Easter egg exchange? And we're like, eh, probably nothing happens. He wrote back saying, that's a good idea, get in touch with these people, and then all of a sudden, we're going to Gamescom, um, we spoke with Xbox and we got a stand at the Xbox um, official uh, booth where we're showing Inculinati. Right next to us there was Pentiment showing their game. I didn't go because I was here, but my friends are from Poland, the devs, so they went over. Obsidian took him for dinner, they paid for that dinner, they paid for drinks, I was like, damn it, I missed out on this. <laughs> uh, and pretty much what we did is we ended up doing this uh, crossover. Uh, a Pentiment in Culinari crossover, where if you actually end up playing Pentiment and you open up the menu and you look at the map or if you look at the glossary in Viscari, you will see in Culinari characters actually being inside that game. Uh, and if you play in Culinari, you can actually play as Andras, the main protagonist from Pentiment, if you choose to, uh, to do so. Now, we kind of kept this quiet for a little bit. Uh, because we kind of thought this could be a cool little beat to use after we come out. Because you know how it is. Your game comes out for like two, three weeks. You're like, hey, this game's wicked. It's new. Then all of a sudden, you're no longer the new thing because a new thing comes along. So you want to come up with some new beats. Um, so we announced this a few, no, about a month after we came out. Everyone was like, oh, this is cool. This is wicked. And we got some nice social media shares. Social media shares. Uh, press wrote about us. Um, we got all this like nice little fanfare and feel good factor. We was like, oh, this is so cool. I like when devs are working with each other. And we really, really wanted to convince Xbox to put like a special tag on the Xbox store, which is just medieval manuscript games, and it would just be <laughs> us in there. <laughs> <laughs> but they said no, and I was like, damn it. Uh, but yeah, so that was pretty cool. So this is a little threat that we turn into an opportunity. So once your nerve settles down and you start yelling at the void, Perhaps there is something good to come out from it. Um, who knows? Uh, lesson number nine, act in the now, think what's next, think silently about your next project. Uh, this is something that the Polish devs uh, kind of taught me, I guess. Uh, is every time they are working on a game, they're already thinking about project number two. 
And some of the reasons for it being is, all right, how can we reuse assets so the production is cheaper? How can we kind of like define the mechanics so we don't have to prototype as much? Um, but also, I guess the main thing was, what do we want to be known for? Uh, like we release our first game, you know, you'll build an audience, people hopefully, you know, will come through. And then once the game comes out, wicked, you know, you, you want to make game number two. How are you going to take that audience to come along with you for the next project and hopefully pick up more disciples along the way? Um, so I know you're probably working on your first, some of you might be working on your first game. Think about what it is that you want to do as a studio, like what's your motto? Because um, this might kind of help you out and help your audience know what you are known for. Uh, yeah, so that could definitely help you out later on. Um, so yeah, think about what's coming up, think about what's next. Uh, it's always kind of nice to have the eye in the future. And I guess this one uh, friend of mine told me, it's like Porsche. Um, their designs are very similar. They believe in the whole idea of evolution, not revolution. So you're kind of thinking about the same way with the studio. Like after a while, game number two, game number three, game number four, you know, like this is what we are known for. Now I know I said nine years, but it's been 10 years, so you only got nine lessons, that kind of sucks. So I was like, all right, let's do some bonus DLC lessons. Um, so DLC lesson number one, tell people what they want to hear. Uh, there's two sides to this. Level one is find out what people in your game's genre like, and then tell them that your game has that. Uh, I know, crazy. Uh, <laughs> now there's this really awesome uh, thing called the Quantic Foundry Gamer Motivational Profile. Quantic Foundry Gamer Motivational Profile. And it's these really, really smart people who made the survey and that realized that people play games for many different reasons. Some people play games because they want to be someone else somewhere, somewhere else and you know, experience a narrative-driven game. Uh, some people play games because they want to express themselves creatively. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of excited about City Skylines too, because uh, I like building little towns and like highways and then I look at other people's highways and go, man, this sucks, my highways. Um, but it's, it's this little you know, way of how you can express yourself and create things. Um, some people play games because they just want to exploit stuff. Some people want to play games because they want to you know, talk to their friends. And there's all these different reasons. And all of those reasons are fine. No one's better than the other. Um, so what you want to do is you want to go into Quantic Foundry Game and Motivational Profile, have a read about those things. And then you, you might, like for example, narrative-driven games, you might think, you might read their profile and they say, so it's for people that like you know, experiencing being somewhere else, somewhere else, having great stories with lots of multi-dimensional characters that have different relationships among them. So you kind of think, read that and go, oh, nice. All right, so if I make a trailer, I should probably put like all these different characters that are in my game, showing all these different relationships that they have. So someone that likes narrative-driven games will look at your trailer and go, oh, wow, there's all these characters in this game with different relationships. You know, I'm interested in that. You know, um, so find out what it is that they like and show it to them. Uh, same with people that want to express themselves creatively. If you're making a little, I don't know, city builder that we can change the different colors of roofs on your houses, you know, and to make it more really nice and cool and matching with the stadiums and such, show that in your trailer. And then people that like that sort of thing go, oh my God, this game can change like roof tiles, you know, and like, this is awesome. So show that, show them what they want to see. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it, it's the way to do it. Uh, level number two, this is a little bit deeper. I, uh, I kind of call it like the propaganda mode. Is find out what people don't like in the industry or in the, your competitors, and then tell them what they want to hear. Uh, very generally speaking, like uh, there's a subsection of gamers who don't like microtransactions, you know? This has been going on for years and years, where they go, oh my god, there are all these publishers, you know, they want to put paid DLCs, etc., etc. So if you're making a game and you're not going to have any paid DLCs, just say, hey, like, when we make games, we want to give a whole uh, experience. We don't want people to pay extra money to get the full experience that we are making. So we will not be making any payable DLCs. If we do any DLCs, they'll be free. And all of a sudden, all those people that sort of have that sentiment, they go, wow, they're, they're talking my language, you know? Like, these are guys are... Uh, for the players. Um, so yeah, read those comments, read what it is that people don't like, um, and just give them what they want. And I, as I'm saying these things, I kind of feel like a sleazy salesman, but um, I don't know, there's, there's reasons why people love things, you know? So just tell them this might actually resonate with you, and that's how you build that audience. 
Uh, then you'll see lesson number two, show features but highlight emotions. If you're making an open world game, um, don't say, oh, I'm making an open world game that's uh, with a map that's five kilometers wide and five kilometers long. It doesn't really say much, does it? Uh, but if you say, oh, make, we're making this map where there will be different sections of it with different tribes, and they'll all react differently to you depending on your actions, all of a sudden you're drawing these images in people's minds of what it is I can do in this game. Now, you don't want to go too nuts and make people go crazy inside their heads thinking, oh my God, I'll be able to do everything in here, and then they'll get disappointed, so you kind of have to manage that. Um, but yeah, show those emotions. Get them to create those images in their heads controllably. Um, and also, when you're writing copy, uh, don't, for example, say, uh, in this game, players will be um, shadow assassins. Instead, say, you are a shadow assassin. It's always you. Put that person in there. Like, they are the main character who's reading this or who you're looking at your material. So they'll be like kind of halfway into your game world and then they might be a little bit more easier convinced to actually make the point and buy a game later on because they're already invested emotionally in it. Um, so yes, uh, make the player center of attention and yeah, create those images in people's minds. DLC lesson number three, study what players are saying about your competition. Uh, Bramble the Mountain King. Uh, another example. Um, now, when we were looking at, I don't like to use the word competition because I don't think there's such a thing as competition. There's so many games being made. It's not like people, you know, buy one game a year and that's it. You know, they, they reach their quota. So you're not really competing with anyone. Um, so look at the references that you have. Now, for Bramble the Mountain King, one of our references was Little Nightmares. And when we looked at the reviews for Little Nightmares, especially the negative ones, we realized that a lot of people were saying. The checkpoints kind of suck because th they're really far away from each other. So if I die, I have to go back quite far, and it's annoying me, hence me going like this on Steam. And so that was an issue that I kept on repeating. So we went to the devs and said, hey, look, maybe something that we should think about is having really short checkpoint systems. So if someone dies, they don't have to go all the way. They can start from like very close by so no one you know, gets annoyed. Devs were like, yeah, that's easy, we can do that. That was implemented, no one said anything about this, there was not even a praise about a checkpoint system being good. When it's usually, you know, it's good, people don't notice it, so we avoided ourselves some bad um, Steam reviews that way. So have a look, see what people are saying, there's gold in those comments. Uh, and finally, last one, DLC lesson number four, do not become a slave to your game. This is something that a friend of mine told me. Uh, or another friend of him told him, a gift that keeps on giving. Um, pretty much take breaks, set boundaries. Don't just be 24 seven in that game. Uh, Cause if you do, you might go nuts. Uh, you might burn out, you might get sick and tired of seeing a game. And this also kind of applies when your game comes out. Uh, if you, you know, once your game is out, sure, like the first few weeks are critical. You know, just in case there's some bugs that you want to fix up, uh, people might have some nuances there, so you want to show people that, hey, you know, I'm actually fixing these things up. But say five, six months later down the track, you know, if someone asks you on your Steam forums on a Sunday, hey, how do I get a golden hat? There's no need for you to kind of like cancel all your plans and go quickly, I need to run on Steam to answer that person. Just set boundaries, tell people, look, just leave questions, we'll answer them between the hours of nine to five, Monday to Friday. Um, Set those boundaries for yourself. You'll be really, really thankful because that project of yours, you will actually come back and love it. Um, so yeah, so I hope that kind of helps out. So that was it. Uh, those were the lessons. I hope that they were good lessons. I hope that you came out with this wiser and not thinking, wow, that was, that was a waste of time. Uh, if you've got any questions, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help out. And I just want to say thank you and awesome for organizing this sort of event too. Like, this is fantastic. So, thanks heaps. Thank you for your amazing presentation. Is You've got heaps of time for questions. So, is there anyone in the crowd that wants to put their hand up? I was just kind of curious, 
more about the financials of like what you do, like as a consultancy, what does that look like? I'm sure it's different for indie games as it's for bigger ones. Like someone approaches you, how do you work all that out? It depends how much I have to do, if that makes sense. Uh, like if I have to take care of everything, then obviously, you know, I guess I'll charge a bit more than I normally would. Uh, but just, I usually just chat it through and, you know, take it from there. I think like everyone's got different needs and different wants. So yeah, just that's how I usually go about it. Um, I was just wondering, when it comes to people who have small budgets uh, and advertising, how much value do you put on paid advertising on platforms like uh, Facebook and Instagram, or do you have an insight into how effective that strategy is? I'm not a huge expert on paid ads. Uh, I know a lot of the devs that I work with, they do use them, and especially Facebook ads. From what I understand, they're like the most effective, the most bang for your buck, in terms of wishlist conversions. Um, I know what some studios do as well is once they come out and they start seeing a profit coming in, they might go, all right, let's just set aside 5% of any money that comes in. Let's just put it into Facebook ads um, or whatever ads, see if you know that can kind of hype up that machine too. Uh, but yeah, I'm not an expert on that field. I know it sometimes, it does help. Uh, it does boost the wish lists. Um, and every time I work with publishers, they do either at the beginning uh, and also any time there's a big sales. Uh, so if you're thinking of going, all right, I'm going 30% or 40% on Steam, that might be a good moment to launch a paid campaign too. Thank you. Um, a few of your points are, are basically about like the design of the game. Sort of your marketing starts there with what your game is. Yes. Do you have any advice for like how to, because you, you touch on like do some research, but do you have any more advanced like hints on how to craft your game mm -hmm. such that will hit with an audience? Yes, Quantic Foundry motivational profile. That's definitely something I really, really love. Uh, I think it, they go really deeply into like what plays from certain genres like. Uh, so that's something that I definitely go to. And a lot of the clients that I work with, some of the bigger ones, they analyze Steam. Um, like especially in the beginning in pre-production when they're thinking of, all right, you know, we're gonna spend heaps of money on a game. Uh, you know, what do people that, you know, play the game that we want to design, what they are looking for? You know, is multiplayer essential? Uh, is just single player enough? Um, so that kind of helps you shape the scope, I guess. And then just reading people's comments, reviews, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, And play testing, play testing, play testing. Uh, I don't have a golden recipe for that. I hope at least that helps out a little bit. Out of curiosity, um, I fully agree with that don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yes. But how do you get this message into the head of clients who had five, six, ten years a totally different experience? As an example, if you have like a client that says, we have optimized our Facebook ads to the point where we pay less than two US dollar for an installation, which is amazing, mind blowing. Yes or a client like Tencent, oh, we can reach 400 million users just with our push notifications. Yes. How do you convince them to not put all their eggs into a proven basket? <laughs> That's a good one. Um, is that a, like a mobile games question? Not, not, only, mob not only mobile games. Mm -hmm. uh, there is also like if you, <coughs> I mean, Deep Silver is now part of THQ. Yes. But Deep Silver was marketing wise very oriented events. Yes. Go to Gamescom, uh, book book advertising in the Allianz Arena, Munich, stuff like that. Yes. And they learned the hard way that it's not sustainable. Yes. How would you teach that uh, to them before they hit the point of no return? Um, good question. Uh, I had a couple of clients, I wouldn't call them stubborn or set in their ways. Um, Without naming names, I had this one client who goes, we're not doing demos, you know? Like, demos stink, you know, like, no way, that's back from like CD-ROM days, you know, no one does it. Um, so the way we kind of had, to, I don't know, convinced that person, um, we just sort of said, look, without going into other people's games, or just saying, I worked on this one game that actually did have a demo, 
And thanks to that demo, we actually generated like X amount of wish lists. So looking at your game, which is kind of similar to the one I worked on, give demo a shot, you know? Um, so perhaps maybe giving references to previous works could make their mind go, okay, well, someone else did it. Maybe I should try it too. Um, and I guess stats can also change people's minds, you know? Um, but then again, you just get people that are stubborn and no matter what you're gonna say, they're just going, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. But I guess using previous examples helps out. We have a pretty upvoted question on Slido, so I'll ask it here for Bianca. Videos or GIFs, which is better? And what about giveaways? 10% discounts at the start of a sale? Question mark. How does that work? Question mark. <laughs> As in, will people feel suspicious of it? Uh, okay, so with the uh, discounting part, it's an interesting one. Um, I remember I released ages ago a game that came out full price on Steam, and some of the comments were like, oh, look at these stingy people. They're not even giving a 10% discount. Um, I also feel right now, people might not be spending as much money as they did during pandemic on games. Uh, definitely there's a sense of less sales coming around, or like, like less in terms of amounts of games being sold. So I think people are a little bit more price sensitive. And I worked on games before that would start with like 20% uh, discounts uh, on release day. And that was something that people go, oh wow, here's a new game, 20% off, let me check it out. And it actually helped out in getting more sales. Um, I also noticed that a lot of multiplayer games, when they launch, they're going with like a 40% discount as well, because pretty much what they're trying to do, they're trying to build user base. Uh, there's nothing worse than a multiplayer game that no one plays. Um, so through that price, you're giving that heavy discount, you know, it's almost like you're buying a copy and your friend's buying a copy for the same price as a full price game. Um, you're kind of encouraging to people to go in, play your game, and once people start saying, wow, this is fantastic, once the discount ends and we go back to normal, we hope that by that time people will buy buying at a full price. I'm a big, big fan of discounts in your game on release. I think like if you don't do it, it's, it's a bad move. Uh, minimum 10%, maybe sometimes even 20%. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of discounts. Um, gifts of videos, I like videos. Uh, <laughs> I don't have any scientific facts to back this up with. Uh, but I think videos work well. Uh, there's just a smoothness to it. You can put the sound to it. I don't know pe people, not many people, you know, play with um, audio. But just in case they do, you know, there's like another sense you can hit them with. Um, and competitions. <sighs> it's a weird one. My first boss, he told me, we'll never do the competitions. We're never giving the game out. As soon as you give the game out, everyone's going to say, oh, all right, they're giving the game out for free. I'm just going to wait until the next competition happens. Is that true? I really don't know. My little red flag is waving in there. Um, so yes, yeah, so I guess you can always test it out and see what happens. Cool. You, you did mention in, uh, in like your lesson nine to act in now and think what's next. Um, mm -hmm. The question about that is, if you want to start, start like establishing like a brand or a series, what happens if, say, your first or your your first game you're currently working on just completely flops. What do you do mm -hmm. about you know helping get that second game boosted up or you know making your series not look like it just been you know a waste? Yes. Hey, well, I think all right. Like sometimes games might not sell, right? But just because a game doesn't sell doesn't mean that you didn't gain anything from it. You know, there might be some people who you know maybe you built a small little community that go, all right, this was actually really wicked. Um, so it didn't sell, you know, millions of copies, but maybe it sold hundreds or thousands. So it, it's a start. Um, so I would, yeah, definitely don't think of a, as a failure, as a, as, 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 as a bad thing in a way, you know? Um, so yeah, so that would be the first thing. Um, I guess the other thing too, I'm just trying to put myself in, your shoe, in, in, in those sort of shoes. If I made a game that completely bombed and I'm thinking, oh, all right, I've got to start from scratch, maybe I'll, I don't know, think, deep inside for like two, three weeks by myself somewhere on a, in a cave, like what it is that I want to do. Um, and then hopefully from there an answers will come. Uh, but I would definitely, what I would do first is whoever bought my game, uh, ask them, you know, what is it that you liked about it? What do you think was great? Read those comments. And maybe there's something in there that you did really, really well that you didn't notice yourself, but everyone else did. 
Maybe that's that little hook slash X factor that can be good for your game number two. Okay, um, I think I've talked to you about this before because I'm kind of in this stage as well, but um, how did you and your team or your clients approach the balance of giving your existing audience new content but also not spoiling them or revealing too much about the game? Mm -hmm. That's a tough one, eh? Um, especially, tough. If, yes, especially if you're working like on, on shorter games that like say for example last, I don't know, four, five, six hours, you're kind of limited by what you can show because you don't want to give out the ending. You don't want to give out the last, I don't know, two levels. You want to keep things secret because, like, I don't know. Like, I played the first Horizon, uh, Zero Dawn, I think. Um, I watched every trailer. I've seen everything about that game before I ended up playing it. And when I started playing it, I was like, oh, I've seen everything. There's, like, no magic. So, yes. Uh, so I would definitely go, all right, I'm not showing the last two levels because that's it. No, we're not doing that. That's, that's for certain. And yeah, recycle, uh, perhaps maybe think of different content that you can do. Um, yeah, it's a tough one, eh? It's a tough one. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I don't have a full answer, but we can chat more about this, so. Eh? <laughs> maybe one last thing I'm going to say. We'll bramble, right? We showed quite a lot um, from the first parts of the game. And we showed it quite frequently. Uh, I was getting sick and tired of seeing it, uh, but not everyone was, you know? So maybe don't go too hard on yourself. So um, I take it you have a lot of Steam experience. So a uh, brutally honest question, how did the change back then in the Steam refund policy affect marketing? Interesting. Uh, interesting question, Steam refund policy. Um, so that was when you're playing two hours, you're getting the game back, right? Yes. Um, all right, definitely what impacted was any game that is shorter than two hours, pretty much people can play for free. Yep. Uh, so that was like a big thing. And it just sucks because there's so many good short games out there, you know? Uh, oh, what's the game where you playing as this little... Yes, yes, uh, that's fantastic. You know, it's just perfect amount of... Um, hours or you know time so yeah so that kind of like suck for those people I guess um, I think but also in another way I think it's it's good too because at least people kind of maybe think about it as a bit of a demo um, so they go all right you know play it see if you like it if you don't you can always give it back um, I kind of see it as a positive to be honest with you but then not for those people that are making short games I guess so it is when an honor system would come into play, you know, where you go, hey, I'll make short games. If you can, please support me, you know. Um, so, yeah, hope that kind of helps out. Hey, uh, great talk. It was really good. Um, I have kind of a specific question about demos. Sure. So there's a trend on Steam at the moment where people are releasing free versions of their game. It's like cut down and it's called like, you the know, prologue? something prologue. Exactly. Yes. Do you know much about the benefits of that compared to re releasing a traditional demo? Not, I'm not super skilled in this, but I'll share with you what I do know. Um, I do know that the prologues can be a fantastic tool uh, to promote your game. Uh, it would be cool if... <laughs> it would be cool if the prologue... Uh, maybe it's like an expansion of the actual main game. So it's like a little tease, maybe like a prequel to what's going to happen in the game itself. So it's kind of teasing people. You end on a cliffhanger with a message, you know, added to your wish list. It can be a cool uh, promotional tool. Because it also shows up on the, you know, free games to play list. There's a lot of people who actually look at those lists and go, all right, I want to play free games. You never know who's going to pick it up. Maybe some sort of a YouTuber or influencer. You can always send them out too. Um, that can be a really good driver of traffic and awareness and, you know, wish this back into your game. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's a good thing. I think it, it's a cool thing if you can do it, uh, go for it. Um, and, I yes, I will maybe do that and then keep that as a separate thing. And then when Steam Next Fest comes along, you can then maybe do an actual demo of your game itself. So you've then got another slice that you can come through and then use that as a promotional tool. 
Um, yeah, so I kind of like it. I'm a fan. Um, Thanks. No worries. Can a game get overhyped? And what do you do when it gets overhyped? Uh, yeah, definitely you can. Oh my god, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I guess you just look at it and watch it burn. <laughs> uh, I mean, the other thing I would maybe do is, uh, I don't know if that's what you're thinking of, but maybe I would, I don't know, release some video, a message to the player saying, hey, like, you know, this is how the game actually looks. Maybe not directly saying, hey, you're overhyped, you know, like get your things in check, but maybe like subconsciously just pulling out videos that explain in the game what they are. It's like they're overhyped because they're thinking, you know, you're gonna be able to do all these crazy things that you go, hey, we, we never said this. Maybe you can set that as an explanation so people kind of go, all right, okay, we went too far with this, we went nuts, um, so yeah. Um, so that's what I would do. So I mean, the, the poster child for this is obviously No Man's Sky for when it, when it originally released. There was a talk that the head of No Man's Sky gave at, I think it was GDC, about two years afterwards. And he basically said, you ship. If you're in a, if you're in a position where your sales of your game are enough that you can keep shipping updates on that game, you keep shipping updates on that game. And No Man's Sky has basically been the comeback kid of the industry because now the game is Im is Im is so well respected because mm -hmm. for seven years they have released free DLC for that game that they could afford to do because all these people bought the game to begin with. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good one. That's true. That's true. Fill up on those promises that you made. Mm -hmm. I had a real hardball question for you. For, for uh, all of the broad marketing topics that your clients come to you with, what's, what's your favorite aspect to work on? Uh, favorite aspect to work on? Good question. I'm kind of enjoying like coming up with collaborations with other games. Uh, that's kind of something I was like, oh, this is really, really cool. Because uh, you can get in touch with other devs and get to meet people and such. I'm kind of enjoying that. Uh, I'm also really enjoying creating, I guess, the strategy and the marketing plan. So like, all right, this is what we're going to say. This is how we're going to say it. When are we going to say it? To whom we're going to say it? All this plan and then kind of organize it into all these different puzzles. And then by the time you start your campaign, it's all out the window anyway because things change. Uh, I kind of like that. Um, so those are my favorite things, I guess. Ooh, if there is, uh, oh, there is one more question. It's probably the last one we have time for this evening. Hello. Uh, short question. Uh, thank you for the talk, firstly. Um, uh, I think it was you mentioned um, uh, posting rhythm and that sort of thing. Um, yes. In terms of yeah, what would you recommend as like a general the time rhythm? Like a few days, a week. What are we talking? Um, depends on the game. It, it depends on the game and on the content that you can show. Because I mean, mm. if you just announce your game and you don't really have that much to show. Well, that kind of already is going to dictate your tempo. They're like, all right, I'm not going to be showing the same screen four screenshots every week uh, for the next few months. So you kind of base it on depending on what you can show. Um, the other thing as well, if, if you kind of organize your marketing beats uh, as to which parts of the game I'm going to be showing when, that can help you kind of determine the rhythm too of how much you're going to be posting because you might go, all right, I'm going to be talking about the next feature in like three months' time. So I can only talk about this. I've got three months until the next sort of set of materials that I'll have. Maybe I'll keep posting once every three weeks sort of thing, you know? Or once every two weeks and once a month do a summary or a little dev blog or whatever. Um, so I guess there is a, this element of consistency. Um, but yeah, I guess what you can box with and what you can play with will also determine the frequency that you have. Thank you. Cool, I think we are wrapping it up for the day. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was, I feel like all energized again <laughs> after that one. <laughs> nice, cool. Um, thanks everyone for joining us for day one of WA Games Week, the talk series curated by game developers for game developers. 
I made up that uh, line like two days ago. I hope you like it. Um, <laughs> uh, join us tomorrow. I think our first session is at 9 a.m. and it's with Mike Stone from Tripwire about how to stand out to publishers. That's pretty cool. Um, we are going to put a poll on the Slido in a second. It's a really quick two-question survey. would love for you all to fill it out on this session. And yeah, have a good evening. Bye.